Hello, hello. Welcome to another live stream here on the Here to Record YouTube channel. Thanks for jumping in, joining us on this uh, on this stream. I have plenty of stuff to discuss today. Uh, the main talk purpose will be talking about the Web Presenter HD, and we have Doug here, but we'll come to that in a second. I just want to say hello to all the folks that are watching. Thanks for tuning in. Here we have um, guys joining us, excited to see Doug and John D dive deep into the settings and the UI. That might help us uh, sort of decide what we're gonna chat about as we go on. Evening from Pando here. Thanks for coming by and joining us. And uh, yeah, Brandy says some behind the scenes action there. We uh, we cut to ourselves a little bit early. We got ahead of ourselves a bit, but we're back again now and uh, the show's going. And um, hello from uh, Finland. Actually, we have a couple of people here from Finland today, which is always nice. Looking forward to the show. And hello from Israel and all over the place. Thanks so much for uh, for tuning in. So I think it makes sense to jump right into the action. And the uh, the first thing I want to say is hello to Doug. Thanks for joining us uh, from uh, Utah. Hey, how's it going? Good to, good to be here. Pretty good, pretty good. Um, I think a lot of people know who you are on this channel. I can imagine that. But I think just a quick... Uh, intro just to just to let them know who you are. Okay, so my name is Doug Johnson. I actually run a video production company in Orem, Utah here in the United States. And uh, my channel on here on YouTube kind of focuses on things that are a little bit more advanced than what uh, what John does on here on his channel. Uh, but uh, I try to cover technology and how things work and kind of teach techniques more so than just reviewing gear and you know, so take a little slightly different approach than a lot of the other YouTubers that are out there. Yeah, I think that's one of the many reasons I really like your channel in general. I've been watching it long before we actually got to chat with each other and get to know each other. Um, but a lot of the equipment that you had, I always thought was like the kind of stuff that I'll eventually buy. And I think I'm still, I haven't got there yet, but I'm slowly still getting there. Um, so I, I absolutely agree that you take things from a different angle. And in the trailer and all that stuff, it, it really is interesting. So there's a link to Doug's channel below this and you can subscribe. But I'm guessing many of the folks here already have, um, there's a lot of crossover between the two channels for sure. Um, for sure. That, I, see, exactly. I see a lot of the same usernames popping up in your chat that come to my <laughs> channel as well. So yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And that all of that kind of brings us to the point where we were chatting the other day about both having the web presenter HD in our hands. Here's the box looking really... Looking really good. And you have it in front of you there, I can see. Um, oh, I took the box away. There it is. That's back again. Um, nothing very exciting about the box. In fact, it's nothing very exciting about it whenever you compare it to like the ATEM Mini Extreme uh, boxes. This one is a little bit more subtle uh, in terms of its uh, branding. But the basic idea was we were having a chat about it and uh, I knew I was going to talk about it on this live stream and I thought I may as well get you in because you've been playing with it a bit as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've used it for I think four events now. Oh, you've actually used it in events. That's even better. Mm -hmm. I've only mm -hmm. really been testing it locally. Yeah, I've used it for, I see two events yesterday and then uh, one a week ago and another, another one before that. So yeah, like four events now. So Nice, nice, nice. So you, I mean, you've got plenty of experience with it in general. Now, I know you have it on the table in front of you there um, mm -hmm. because I want to just do like a quick tour of the device just so people know what it looks like. So it's yep. that one third rack inch size right which is kind of the teranex standard in a sense if that's not uh, the wrong term right exactly it's one third of a rack space you can fit three of these side by side using the black magic teranex shelf is what they call it and it's really easy to mount just mount a couple of screws in the bottom and and uh yeah so really compact nice small unit that uh does quite a lot in a small package exactly that's that's the next question is uh what does it do so my use case for um, for getting it in general, I, I tend to stream from home here via the A10 Mini Extreme. I'm not doing that today, but we can come to that in the post show how we're putting this show together today. But I tend to stream directly out of the A10 Mini Extreme. Um, but what I wanted, if you've watched this channel before, you know I talk a lot about 4G internet here in the house, and I'm a little bit concerned. So sometimes I really want to just push 720p, and um, that was one of my main reasons to grab the device. Also, I wanted to make some videos about it and stuff, but I wanted the flexibility of being able to stream something as low as 720p. Um, in my case, I might not push it up to 4K, but maybe you have a different idea of why you bought it. Well, I mean, partially what's, so I could do a review on my channel, but it's also 
kind of funny, like I won't necessarily be using this for streaming all the time, but uh, one of the things that I really like about this is the status display that it has. So the monitor output that's on this thing, it's actually really, really cool. And I can actually show you. Yeah, do that. that. Looks do like. that. It looks really cool. Yeah. So, so yeah, there it is. So this is the status display. Whenever you hook it up to a monitor, uh, either HD, via HDMI or the SDI output, this is what you see. And so you get a lot of information about what's going on, about the quality of your of your video and, and audio signals and how the stream is holding up, you know, so you can see your bit rate and if it's caching, there's just a lot of information there. And so even if I'm not necessarily using it for streaming, there's a lot of good information that would be great to have on a monitor just off to the side whenever I'm technical directing, just to make sure that the video signal itself is actually looking the way that it's supposed to. You're absolutely right. I think that's one of the sort of key sellers. In fact, I have my display <laughs> run up here as well, just so I could take a look at it. But um. Whenever it was introduced, it was one of the things that I got really excited about in general was this display. I can just see that up in a venue somewhere or even I want to find a place to put it up here in the in the house so I can have a constant eye on audio. Last week, I muted myself accidentally, but if I had this up um, right in front of me, I could really see there's clearly audio going through right now. I'm just looking at it down here on the side. Um, but all of the other things, maybe, Doug, if you can just explain the stuff that's over there just a little bit better. I know um, you might know some of those technical things more than I do. Yeah, I don't know how technical you want me to get. Uh, I, can, I can explain a lot of what's going on here. But uh, yeah, so first of all, you can see kind of information about uh, the stream itself. So where it's going, uh, what, you know, in this case, it's uh, set up to go to YouTube, to their primary server, and you can see just the beginning of the stream key there. You can see what video standard you've got set up currently. So like, you notice but down below, I'm actually sending it a 4K signal, but it's going to be streaming in 1080. This, this only streams in 720 and 10 and 1080. It doesn't do 4K for the streaming itself, but you can see what video format you're streaming in, and it will do the conversion uh, from whatever format is coming into it. And then you can see which preset you've got going on there as well. So, you know, if you're in a venue where you've got lower bandwidth, you can set that to streaming low or whatever. And by editing the XML files, which has probably been covered pretty well on your channel and others, uh, it's an XML file that has all the configuration settings. And you can import that into the web presenter and set up your own presets for bit rate and servers and whatnot. So, uh, but that, yeah, that top section there is really just focused on what's happening with the stream itself. And then right. if you wanted, to, if you wanted to go further in detail on the others, we can do that as well, but I'll let, I'll let you make that call. Let's just talk because I, I see here, um, I have a comment here. Graham says lots of, uh, where is it? There we go. Lots of X's and L's there, Roman numbers or something else. Can you just touch on those little X's and L's? That's the one thing I, I, I tried to look into on the manual, but it's way outside of my sort of understanding, but we can go there. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, let's, uh, we can focus on the video ones first. So the video input here down at the bottom, it's got this section called Lumin luminance bits. And you can either, you'll either see X's, L's or H's whenever there's a signal present. And X basically indicates a bit in that data, so a binary, binary bit, that's constantly changing. So you've actually got an active signal on there that's doing something. And an L is a bit that's constantly low. So in the case of what I'm seeing here, so with SDI video, it's normally 10 bit. Uh, but in this case, the last two bits are L, which is telling me that my camera is only sending an 8 bit signal. So the last two bits are constantly low. And the same thing with chroma over here, which Again, yeah, so it's my camera is outputting an 8-bit signal, and I can tell by looking at this information here that uh, even though SDI supports 10 bits, that it's actually only getting 8 bits in. So, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, I'm sure I know that you'll have lots of uh, videos, or well, I'm not going to push it on you, but I'm sure you'll have videos explaining this stuff in technical details. And for sure, I've already started outlining my personal video on this stuff, and um I might have to skim over a few of these technical details. So I'll, I'll point people in your direction for those, uh, for those final little bits and pieces for sure. There's a question here. Um, and I think we might have covered this just a little bit, but uh, never quite understood from Ian, never quite understood where this product stands in the Blackmagic lineup. Is there any point if you own other ATEM mixers? Now for my use case, or my thinking here on this is that um, Sure, if you only ate ten minis and stuff, you 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 wouldn't have a good reason to use to look into this. Maybe unless you have my particular use case that I mentioned earlier. But if you own any of the other ATEMs, the one ME, the two ME, the four ME, the television studios, all those things, none of those even have recording or streaming built in. So, and who knows what kind of devices? I mean, a bit of my prediction for the next range of ATEM 
lineup is they might still skip all that streaming and recording stuff in the bigger items and uh, sort of force you, as a, so to speak, into getting this kind of device instead because it sits nicely in that 20, uh, that 4K uh, 30 uh, area. And um, I can see people using that all the time, plus the HyperDeck and stuff. But maybe you had something else in mind, Doug. Well, the interesting thing about this product is, uh, you know, it's not really for those who have ATM minis because not only do those, most of those have their own encoders built in, this only has an SDI input and none of the ATM minis actually have an SDI output. So if you were going to use it with one, you'd have to convert the HDMI output of your ATM mini to SDI, even to get video into this in the first place. So this really is a product meant for people who are using equipment, probably positioned a little bit higher end uh, in Blackmagic lineup than the ATM mini series. But you can certainly use it with one as long as you really, as long as you're uh, going to take the time to convert that HDMI to SDI. And that would give you a second place to stream. So if you wanted to stream to say Facebook and YouTube at the same time, you could do that. Exactly. Exactly. So there's, there are a ton of use cases. Maybe if you're coming at it from an ATM mini line, lineup, it might not make initial sense, but there's definitely a bunch of use cases that I can see people using it for all, all, all over the place. Uh, another question. Doug, I'm going to throw this at you from MJ here saying, uh, can you stream to the streaming bridge using the web presenter HD? I have not tried it myself, but I heard that it does work. So uh, I'm going to venture out and say, yes, it does. I just haven't seen that for myself. I threw that on you there um, out of the <laughs> blue. Uh, I, I, I'm with you on that. I haven't tested it yet, but it's, I've read about it in the manual and um, I, I see that it works in theory and I've, I've seen some people do it, but I personally haven't you know, flip the switch and, and tried it myself. So we're, we're going to say a, a very solid yes on that um, for sure. <laughs> and we'll test it more maybe before we um, throw our stuff out there. Um, lots of people joined us uh, a little bit later, which is still perfectly fine. Hello from Bali and uh, from Vegas here. And a couple of people just came in there. Paul says, hello, Doug and John. Thank you so much for joining us in the stream here. <laughs> a nice big hello from Doug there. Um, and if you do have any questions about any specifics on the web presenter HD, then uh, let us know. Um, because there's, it's funny, there's lots of features built in. And there's one feature that doesn't exist yet. And there's a button on the front that says call. Um, and I read the manual specifically, and it did say this is coming soon. But uh, who knows if that'll happen? Any ideas what that button might do? I have no idea on that one. Like, a lot of their <laughs> other products where they have features that are not available at launch, I can kind of figure out what it is. This one, I have no clue. Yeah, yeah. I'm still, I'm still bitter about the, um, the Blackmagic Shuttle version two recorder. And there was a button on there. I don't remember what it said. HUD maybe or something along. Display or there was some button on there. And they said, this will definitely come out. And it never happened. So, um, so I, whenever I see a button that says, we're going to add this someday, like this thing, no. Yeah, the Sting button on the A10 Mini Extreme. I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll believe it when I see it. Definitely. I, I think but in the it, case of the Sting button, they don't they don't don't even mention it in the, in the manual at all. So <laughs> that's, right. like, that's true. Yeah, that's everybody's right. left to wonder though. I have a pretty good idea what that one is, and I did a video about that on my channel. You did? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I I, I will not show it on the front here, but the the front panel, if you haven't seen the other Terranex lineup of devices, it uses the exact same uh, form factor and also the same front panel on there. And it's sort of like the ATEM, um, yeah, you can see it there. Doug showed it real quick. But there's that six buttons there that do certain things, on air, off air, set menu, lock, and uh, the call button, the infamous call button that doesn't actually do anything yet. Um, but because they use that sort of form factor, my guess is um, they just had a button to fill. Sort of like the, what, what was that device? The um, the advanced panel, there's a couple of buttons on there that don't seem to do anything either mm -hmm. as far, if I remember correctly. So it's like, we have a button row. We want to put a button there. Maybe someday we'll put something on there. Cold call. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, well, it's not, it's not, it wouldn't be unlike Blackmagic to add new functionality down the road, but at the same time, it wouldn't also be unlike them to just never do anything with it either. So we just don't know yet. Absolutely. That is absolutely right. <laughs> Um, let me see here. We have a question. This one's not web presenter related, but I think we can just take it now anyway. Um, uh, Pandu says, I've been trying to get a good video switcher for hundred for under 150, uh, I guess, UK pounds, and I can't find one. Do you know any? Thanks. That is, um, that's a thinker. That's a, that's a, I would say that's a pretty low budget if I'm being um, honest about it. 
150 pounds. I think I would probably save a bit more and go for the ATEM Mini. I don't remember the, the UK price on that off the top of my head, but it's probably not much more than that. It might be worth sticking out a little. Anything in mind, Doug? Uh, I can't really think of anything thing else that would, would uh, fit the bill there. That is pretty low price. Uh, I mean, in the world that I come from, a video switcher for $1,000 or £1,000 would be amazing. Uh, the fact that the ATEM Mini came out at 295 just kind of blew everybody's minds, and that's still an amazing price for what it is. Yeah, it, it really is. The The use cases for that actually st- still pop up for me from, from time to time. Even weird things like I don't have enough long HDMI cables to get across <laughs> my room, so I'll just go into it and back out of it again. Like silly things like that or, you know, a, a, a big box that's basically just a capture card into Zoom, which makes me it makes me laugh when I see it. One thing coming in and one thing going out. So um, yeah, I think I think that's the one to to head in the direction of definitely. Um, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. We have some questions. I think we can jump into this now while we wait for some more questions to come in. Um, there is some questions popping up, Doug, if you don't mind, about the the companion video you posted recently, because I think it would be worth just tucking in on that a little bit if you're if you're up for that. Sure, that's fine. Um, uh, Richard here says, and a similar one right after that, but Richard says, we'd love to hear John's take on Doug's recent companion reliability video. And then I'm just going to show this one right after that and says, Frankie, oh, can I show that? It's not working. I'll read it out. Uh, Frankie says, hey, Doug and John, not a question about the web presenter, but can you discuss using the ATEM with companion, thinking about Doug having had some issues? So just as a, maybe a quick recap, Doug, what what's going on? Okay, so um, I have had some problems with uh, BitFocus Companion being what I would call 100% reliable. And I've done more research since I did my video, and it turns out that it seems like a lot of the problems that I'm having are, are related to the fact that I'm running kind of an unusual configuration here. And the people that I talk to that run Companion with an ATEM Mini, it seems to run just fine, no, no problems there. But like I'm running in a situation where I've got eight HyperDeck Studio Minis, I've got two video hubs, I've got... Uh, my my four or my two me switcher. I've, I've got a very unusual configuration. I'm also using it to control my intercom, with a, uh, which is a Behringer X32 mixer, and just all that weird combination of things seems to be exposing some weaknesses in the code. So for most people, it's going to be fine. But for someone who's in a situation like mine, where you've got just tons and tons of hardware, it seems like there's some polish that could be yet to be done on the application. Right. Yeah. Because I think that's that's sort of my take as the question asked what was my take on that? And I guess I've been using it for a long time without any issues, but for, for all of my things that I use it for, I'm pairing it to like, you know, two, three devices at a time. There's only two, three devices on the same network at the time. So the, the, the level of complexity or complications that might arise, I haven't, I haven't hit up against those at all. Um, but, but like you said, whenever you want to use it for um, a much more complex setup, then finding these errors, especially like you, you, like you talked about in your video, Finding these sort of errors whenever you're actually live streaming or recording is the most terrifying time to find any issues in any equipment. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's kind of crazy, though. I mean, I, I'm, using, I'm really pushing this thing to its limits. And, you know, I've got a lot of scripts and a lot of those buttons that are running 20 or 30 commands. And it just seems like that's probably pushing it just a little bit too hard. And so for, for people who are using it in a more uh, sane environment, it probably is going to work fine. But uh, for those of us who are really pushing it, pushing the edge that might, might not be as stable as we might want. So, yeah, exactly. But I, I think I'm the only thing I would say on the end is like, I'm fairly confident in the mass team that's trying their best or trying really hard and working really hard on it all the time that they can take these things on board and uh, really nail down any issues that they can fix on their end or help out. So I know that they're, constantly making improvements and stuff. And, I, and I'm hoping that as time goes on, we can hear back from you if, if things get better or if you're able to use it more in your production and stuff. Yeah, I haven't used it for a big production since I made that video, but I've, I have had it running for some of the smaller ones. I've actually got it running right now, just like, uh, you know, help me control my recorders and whatnot. And most of the time it is fine, but, you know, there have been a few occasions when it has failed and, and failed in a fairly catastrophic way. Yeah, that's not at all what you want. In fact, there's a question um, uh, from P... From P, believe I, I I did that my best at that. John, do you just grab the latest beta version of Companion, or do you stick with older, more stable releases? In my case, I go 
whenever I need a new version on a computer or if I'm downloading something, excuse me, I, I just go for the latest beta build because all of the gigs that I'm doing right now, I, I've never leave this house basically. So all the gigs I'm doing right now are for me um, and for this live stream and for recording and I use it for day-to-day -day operation. So I'm not so worried about being on the latest and greatest beta build at all. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing in terms of all other software and chains and stuff, Doug, I'm guessing that's not really the kind of thing that you live by the edge on. Well, generally speaking, yeah. I mean, you, the last thing you want is uh, something you're relying on to, to fail on you right in the middle of a big uh, event where you've got a paying client that's given paying you a lot of money in order to, to produce a polished polished product. So generally speaking, you, want, you do want to stay away from beta products in that kind of situation. So that's why I have, I have traditionally stayed on the full releases of Companion and other applications. You, know, you don't want to be taking the risk of untested code in a production environment. Absolutely. That's very fair. In fact, just that leads us on to MJ's question here. Doug, what are you using to control your trailer setup? <laughs> okay. Um, so most, most stuff I'm actually using the just macros application and X keys controllers. You know, I've got, uh, like there's, there's a little 24 button one here that I use for this sort of thing. Uh, that, that's kind of, that covers the majority of it. And for, uh, the rest of it, I am using companion and just, I, I'm, not 100% confident the companion is really going to be stable all the time. And so when I have the bigger events, I kind of shy away from, from integrating that into, into the setup. That makes perfect sense. Here's another question for you from Go Web Technologies. Um, we've totally lost the Web Presenter HD question, <laughs> but that's perfectly fine. We can, uh, we can talk about that at any other time. <laughs> um, uh, Doug, after all that you did to your trailer, what is the one thing on the priority list that you want to upgrade or change? You only can say one thing, Doug. That's all you can get. Only one thing? Oh my gosh. Um, well, I'd love to be able to move up to a Constellation switcher. Uh, not that the one I have here is a huge limitation in terms of what I'm able to do, but having a, having additional MEs on my switcher would be nice. I actually use the, the additional MEs on switchers quite a bit, and so moving to a Constellation would be pretty awesome. But Unfortunately, not only is the price prohibitive, the power consumption is as well. You know, and since I'm running in a trailer and I have to be able to pull power from a venue, I have to, I'm a limit on how much power I can draw. And switching my switcher out, my current 2ME switcher for a constellation would actually push my push me past my power budget. So, uh, yeah, so. yeah. See, there's 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 too much to consider in those kind of things. I wouldn't even think about that. In fact, that's one thing I was. I, I guess I understand your trailer very well because I've watched all the videos and I, I get I get all the gear. I understand all that stuff. The networking stuff is a little bit out of my um, comfort zone, but the power stuff that mm -hmm. I just, I totally do not get any of those things. I've never had any real experience with managing power things. So when I watch those portions of your videos, I'm equally interested and also equally terrified of that <laughs> stuff. And I guess you have some background in that stuff, though. Is that right? Well, some. I mean, I've been doing electronics since the time I was a little, little kid. So 40 right. plus years at this point, you know. And uh, years ago, I was, I was really good friends with a, a professional electrician. And I learned a lot from him. He taught me a lot. And in fact, a few years ago, uh, the place I live in, the house I live in, we had a problem with uh, water. We had a water leak and it flooded the basement. And as part of that, we decided to rewire the kitchen. And I did all the work for that myself. So I learned a lot about like electrical and what the codes are and how all that kind of stuff works. And I, of course, I had my electrician friend come in and, and advise and double check everything that I did to make sure it was all safe and legal and everything like that. Uh, but you know, I spent a lot of time watching YouTube videos too. There's a lot of information out there about how to do that kind of thing. The solar stuff was new to me. I'd never done anything with solar prior to doing the trailer. And I've done quite a few upgrades on that since I got it. Uh, but just in terms of the AC electrical, that really wasn't too hard for me. I'd already done that kind of thing quite a bit. Good. That's good experience to have because I mean, even outside of production, I I'm looking into solar for this house here and, uh, yeah, I just start looking into it and then I'm like, uh, okay. I don't know where I'm going here. I need to get some professional help at some point. So maybe I'll give you a call about that someday. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'm learning about solar though, is, uh, it's not, not necessarily a great financial uh, decision to make. It takes a long time to pay off. 
In fact, in the trailer, it'll never pay off. I've done the math. It's never going to pay off. And the main reason oh. I did it in the trailer is to supplement the, the power that I have coming from the venue or when I'm running from a generator. If I can produce five or 600 watts of power with solar, that means that I'm using, I'm pushing my generator that less hard. Not only that, if the power goes out, I can run that much longer. As it currently stands, I'm able to run for almost two hours just on battery here in my trailer. Uh, and it's even longer if I have the solar panels uh, actually receiving a decent amount of sunlight. Right. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's... Mm. We'll, we'll come back to that at some point, I'm sure. We'll talk about all sorts of power stuff. I have a question um, about the Web Presenter HD. Isn't that... We've, we've looked back to where we back, were. Back on topic, um, nice. <laughs> back on topic. And I, I'm, I can show this off now, but MJ asks, question about the Web Presenter HD. What does the program setup look like? And what can you do with the program utility? And now I can show you that here in a second. I'm just cleaning up some weird... Uh, all the windows on my desktop so I can cut to that. And uh, here we go. Too many buttons. All right. I'm sure you can see that just fine. I'll take away that um, comment as well. There's actually not too many settings in here. If you have an eight times streaming bridge, though, it's fairly similar to that. Um, in fact, I can just cancel out of that. And you get to look at your web presenter HD here. If you have multiple, you can find them all in here. Um, and there's two tabs. The setup tab is the sort of usual setup things, network and resetting and, and the um, the versions and all that stuff. But in the live stream here, I can set my streaming standard, just like the ATEM minis, you can set it up for auto mode. Um, and then you have from 720p 25, all the way up to uh, 1080p 60. Uh, so the, the device itself can accept from 720p all the way up to 2160p 60 if I'm not mistaken, but you can only stream up to 1080p 60. Below that, you have some settings, like uh, here's where you would load in your, um, like we talked about earlier, the streaming bridge settings. And then below that, you also have all your platforms there. Uh, there's a few included and you can also add your own as well. So like I said, there's not too much in there that you can actually do with the, um, with the utility, but it's some of the basic stuff. And in fact, on the device itself, there is a menu system which gets you all the same stuff, basically. And I think there's nothing else missing from the menu system that I can think of, right, Doug? Not that I'm aware of. I can't think of anything, but it sure would be a lot of fun to enter a stream key on the front panel, though. I mean, <laughs> six, what, 16 character alphanumeric string when using a, oh, a dial? <laughs> that, would be, that would be a real nightmare, that's for sure. Yeah. I, I actually, you can do I, it. Oh, you can. Yeah, it'll let you do oh, it. I didn't yeah. try. I didn't even try because I wouldn't even want to try uh, to see how that does. <laughs> um, here's a question related to it uh, from Let's Produce Stuff. Why does Blackmagic not write the MAC address on these devices? It's such a pain to get it to work in a corporate network without this information, and you don't have a local uh, router to look it up. Any answers? I have no idea why they why they wouldn't do that. <laughs> most most devices that have Ethernet ports, they do include a MAC address on a sticker. But yeah. in the case of this, and let's look at in the menu. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, even show just... up in the menu. So you'd have to boot it up and plug it in something in order to figure out what that is. Yeah, that's the, that's a good question. You have to or write it out on a sticker yourself and um, go to the effort yourself. Well, cool. We'll take more questions in the post show. The post show, if you're watching live, you can stick around for that. It's um, going to start in a minute or two. You don't have to go anywhere. Just stick around. And we're going to take all sorts of questions on the Web Presenter HD or whatever else comes up along the way. I just wanted to thank uh, Brendan, who became a member of the channel. Um, I think it was like a day ago. I just happened to pop up and I saw it whenever I came in and, and to check a few other things. And then I also wanted to, of course, thank all the supreme supporters of the channel, Patrick and uh, Jim at Cloud Bedrock. I always appreciate the support from all the members and the um, super supreme supporters as well. Uh, like I said, we'll just go into the post show, take some more questions and talk with Doug in a few seconds. So uh, let's go for that. I'll see you in a few seconds. <laughs> 